Wow. Well, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of the God of mercy and the God of love. Teachers can't teach uh, unless people come with open hearts and open minds. In fact, if you're a Facebook friend of mine, uh, my Facebook line for today says, and yesterday says, go into Grand Rapids, Michigan to give a series of talks. I hope they come with open hearts and open minds. And you have. And I'm very grateful. Deeply. If you had a chance to be here in the morning, you heard me say that uh, I have this rather boring and trite way of beginning every talk by thanking people for the gift of their time. And I'm going to keep up that proud tradition. And to thank you, I am mindful and aware of the fact that the moments of your life and my life are finite and measured, and that time is the one commodity that we have that is irreplaceable. If you're a person like me, who used to have hair and now doesn't, uh, and used to wear medium size clothing, and then I was extra large for a while and extra, extra large for a while, now I'm back down to large, <laughs> it means that in your closet you have lots of different kinds of clothing. And you can give those away and buy some more. If you're an academic, and if you're guilty of coveting, it is not coveting thy neighbor's ox, and in my age, no longer coveting thy neighbor's wife or thy neighbor's car, but you might covet thy neighbor's books. <laughs> you might give your books away, as I periodically do to my students, and watch them not come back, and you can go out and buy some more. Time is different. When we spend a moment of our life doing something, there's no way of getting that same moment back. It's one reason why in the Islamic tradition we're called to be children of the moment. Like a child, freshly born in every moment, ibn al -waqt. And to live in the kind of purity and joy that children do where there is a wonder in every minute. And I think that's a beautiful way of, of living. Yet the subject tonight is a wonderful subject, um, the Prophet Muhammad. And it's going to be referencing this book that I had a chance to work on for a few years of my life. And I guess I'll begin by telling you a little bit about how this particular book, Memories of Muhammad, came to be. Uh, authors, even when they're academics, especially when they're academics, are great liars. Uh, and one of the things that we all do is to retrospectively construct a narrative for how our books came to be. <laughs> we all make it seem so purposeful as if we sat out years ahead of time having a detailed chapter by chapter outline and a specific publisher in mind and just the way that the whole narrative was going to flow. Uh, that ain't what happened in this case. So a few years ago, about three and a half years ago, the l largest publisher of books on religion and spirituality in the country, HarperCollins, came knocking at my door and said, Professor Safi, we've been following you. We want you to write a book for us. And I was like, yes, yes, please. <laughs> and we will pay you very handsomely. I'm like, I'm interested, go on. <laughs> Enough money that you can finally buy that BMW of your dreams. Excellent, go on please. Yes, my soul is available for sale. I can be had at the right price. Um, and they said, we want you to write a book called From Muhammad to Bin Laden. <laughs> and that's what I said. I was like, oh, my shiny new BMW, how I covet thee, my nafs, my ego self, wants you so badly, but you're just out of my reach. Um, and they said, we have done a lot of research into the reading habits of Americans. I was like, oh. And they said, 
those Americans who still read <laughs> do so at short readings, at short sittings. I'm like, sitting? What does that mean? Well, they said, well, our marketing team has done a lot of research. And it turns out that those Americans who still read, as opposed to looking up things on a computer, now most frequently read, you guessed it, in the bathroom. <laughs> the bathroom is now the most frequent reading site in American homes. <laughs> Sitting. <laughs> and think of the typical bathroom visit. So. The new trend in religious writing <laughs> is to write in such a way that we cater to this style of sitting, reading, meditation. In other words, they wanted to have a book where every chapter was broken up into short little segments that they could finish in an eight minute or so <laughs> visitation. And I was like, you're hurting my soul. The longer you speak, the more I ache. <laughs> but I want my BMW. <laughs> so I signed the contract. <laughs> but then, as I often do, mom always said, better to do what you want to do and then apologize later. So I did. Um, and here was, I didn't mean to be a naughty boy. It just kind of happened along the way. I thought, well, if I'm going to write a 15-chapter book to cover our 15 centuries of Islam, the first chapter would be the Prophet and the revelation of the Quran. So I wrote a lot about the Prophet Muhammad and the revelation of the Quran. And then at some point I thought, well, I have to talk about Islamic law because everybody wants to know about Sharia. If you say it as Sharia, it just makes you sound erudite. But if you say Sharia, then it's scary. <laughs> just like a madrasa. A madrasa is a seminary. It's a Muslim seminary. The oldest continuously operated universities in the world. It's not Oxford. It's not Cambridge. It's Al-Azhar in Egypt. Opened about 250 years before Oxford and Cambridge. Right? Madrasa is a distinguished site of learning where faith and learning come together. Madrasa <laughs> is a scary place where terrorists go to train. So if I have to talk about madrasas and sharia, I have to talk about the fact that one of the goals of Islamic law is to live not only in accordance with how God would want us to live, but also to live by emulating the Prophet Muhammad. So if I'm going to write about Islamic law, I have to talk about the Prophet. So I wrote about the Prophet. What else do people always want to know? Uh, the jihad question. Oh yes, I have to talk about the jihad question. Well, presumably if I want to know how one is to fight. And Islam, the majority of the Islamic tradition, just like news not to most of you, just like the majority of the Christian tradition, has not been a pacifist tradition. It has been a tradition very much akin to the just war tradition. There has to be sufficient cause to go to war. In war, you conduct yourself a certain way, and here's how you get yourself out of war, something which we in this country seems to have a particularly hard time uh, figuring out. So if I want to understand jihad and how jihad actually was practiced by the Prophet Muhammad, I have to write about the Prophet Muhammad. Other than jihad and the question of violence, what other question do most people have? The woman question. If I'm going to address the woman question, I have to begin by not just the verses of the Quran, but by how the Prophet actually treated his wife. And at a later point of his life, just like a good biblical king prophet, his wives. So I have to write about the Prophet Muhammad again. What else do people want to know today? Uh, I don't know. Jerusalem. Well, if I want to talk about why Jerusalem 
is important, not just to Jews, not just to Christians, but also to Muslims, and God's great sense of humor saying, I'm going to take this little place the size of Rhode Island and make it beloved to all these cousins, and then I'm going to step back and watch them fight over it. Ha, 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 ha. Right? I, I choose to look at God as being deeply engaged with human history, but just sometimes in a more humorous way than I think most theologians would probably grant. Well, if I want to talk about why Jerusalem matters to Muslims, I have to be willing to talk about the way that for Muslims the Prophet went from Mecca to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem up to heaven. So to understand the centrality of Jerusalem for Muslims, I have to talk about the Prophet Muhammad. Make the story short, Everything I tried to write ended up coming back to the Prophet Muhammad. Devotion, piety, spirituality, mysticism, art, poetry ended up coming back to Muhammad. And so what was supposed to be from Muhammad to bin Laden kind of ended up sort of kind of being from Muhammad to Muhammad. And so I had to pick up the phone, call the publisher and be like, um, I've already bought my BMW, <laughs> but how would you feel if from Muhammad to bin Laden ended up being memories of Muhammad? Uh, the person on the other end of the line, who is a committed evangelical Christian, said some very, very bad words. <laughs> Uh, calling into certain question my ancestry and the relationship between my parents at the time of uh, my conception. And then he put on his marketing thinking hat and said, this isn't what you were supposed to do. Will it sell? And I was like, well, Oh, I don't know, publish it and we'll see if it sells. Um, and so they published it, and alhamdulillah, as we say, praise be to God, it has sold, so I'm, I'm off the hook a little bit. Now, when I was writing this book, I began to write it with a very wide general audience in mind, not primarily written for Muslims that have grown up with stories and anecdotes and teachings about the Prophet, but for a general audience. And I'm not going to lie, I'll be honest here, I thought most non-Muslims are kind of dumb when it comes to Muhammad. They don't know anything. So I have to start at a pretty low level. Now mind you, that assessment is based on 20 plus years of interfaith work and activity, right? So it's justified prejudice. <laughs> and here's how I arrived at that conclusion. Usually when places invite me for interfaith work and I get a chance to spend a few days with them, I don't just jump in to Islam. I actually first try to gauge their level of religious literacy. So I first ask them with a tradition that I assume they know the best. In a Christian context, it would obviously be Christianity. In a Jewish context, it would be Judaism and so on. So I'd first ask them about who can tell me some stories from the life of Jesus. And if it's a Christian audience, there's no shortage of eager hands that go up. Right? I get the Good Samaritan story, the Prodigal Son story, the Crucifixion and Resurrection story, this and that. Okay? And then I ask them, what is your favorite color? What Christian virtues do these stories and anecdotes demonstrate? Love. Apparently, nobody else in the world loves other than Christians. Love is like supposedly a Christian monopoly. <laughs> right? It's like you play monopoly and the Christians are like, we put down a hotel on love. <laughs> if anybody else loves, they have to pay us rent. You know? <laughs> I have four children. I'm Muslim. I love my kids as much as you could ever love your kids. I'm not going to pay rent. You don't own love. And then, you know, our Jewish friends are like, we own redemption. And we own the law. I'm like, I I I'm running out of things to own here. And the Buddhists are like, we own compassion and non-attachment. And Muslims are like, uh, what do we have left? <laughs> so then I ask the same primarily Christian audience, Let's switch tradition and talk about Judaism. What stories can you tell me 
about the life of significant Jewish prophets. They get a lot more shy, not as many hands go up, and then I ask them, what can you identify as significant Jewish religious and ethical and spiritual virtues? If it's a Christian audience, they're very shy, obedience to the law, God redeeming his people from bondage. Okay. Then I ask them to switch traditions, and we talk about the Hindu tradition. What can you tell me about the life of significant figures of Hindu mythology, like Krishna? What Hindu virtues, religious values can you name? Yoga. <laughs> Vegetarianism. Guys laying down on a bed of nail. I don't know. We got nothing. <laughs> You ask him about the Buddhist tradition. I don't know, he got tired and he sat down under some tree. Some cosmic stuff happened. Right? And then and only then do I come back to the story of Islam. And I ask him the question, what narratives, episodes, moments from the life of Muhammad can you tell me about? And at that time, usually, there's a deafening kind of silence in the room. Which is odd, because Islam has not been absent from our political and media discussion at least since 9-11, and probably for 30 years. Islam and Muslims are in the news every day. And you ask people to tell you something about the life, the teachings of the founder of the Islamic tradition, and they got nothing. And then what's more embarrassing is you ask them, all right, let's even say that we're playing religion monopoly. Christians, you guys went first and landed on love. Jews, you get law. Hindus get renunciation. Buddhists get compassion and non-attachment. I ask my audience, can you name for me a religious, ethical, moral value that would come out of the heart of the Islamic tradition? And they're like, uh... I'm like, no, my, my first year students make that sound. <laughs> and somebody says, jihad. I'm like, look, you got to have love. They got to have law. They have, and I get jihad. <laughs> There's oftentimes not a single religious moral virtue that they can identify as coming from the Islamic tradition. It's not that they think there are no nice Muslims, but that if there are some, they are nice in spite of Islam. Not through it, not because of it. So, when I was trying to write this book, what I thought about first was, instead of writing a boring biography of Muhammad, why don't I go and study what Muslims have said about the Prophet over the last 1400 years, and why don't I pay attention to what are the top three, four, five moments in Muhammad's life that for Muslims best exemplify the teachings of Islam. And why don't I highlight some of those moments? So I set aside doing that. And there's three main moments in this book that I'm going to read for you today. Interestingly enough, all of them are cyclical. The prophet goes up a mountain, receives the revelation from God, and comes back down the mountain to deliver that message to humanity. The prophet goes from Mecca to Jerusalem up to heaven, has this profound, mystical, face-to-face -face encounter with God, and returns out of compassion to humanity. The prophet and his companions are exiled from their place of birth, Mecca, to the city of Medina, and they return triumphantly to that same town. So there's always going up, coming down, being sent out, coming back in. <coughs> and 
and I'm going to read for you some parts of this particular um, set of cycles, this set of mov movements and moments that for Muslims have demonstrated some of the key Islamic virtues. But then, as I was saying this morning, I learned that no community has a monopoly on ignorance, and something kind of funny happened when I started to read what contemporary Muslims are saying about the Prophet. And lo and behold, I discovered that it's not y'all, as we say down south, <laughs> the allegedly ignorant non-Muslim population that doesn't know a lot about the Prophet Muhammad. But it actually Muslims too, today, contemporary Muslims have forgotten much of what we used to know. That the Muslims' understanding of the Prophet has undergone an important shift. And I will talk about that as well. This is what I'm calling a sort of spiritual amnesia for contemporary Muslims. I can talk about it at a theological level, mystical level, and it's pretty easy, actually, to understand. And then I will talk about it at a visual level. One of the things I've learned as a, as a teacher is that some people grasp ideas best by hearing it, some people see it best by looking at images, so I'll try to give you both. Here's the level of teaching part. Up until the year 1800, maybe even 1850, if you ask Muslims what is spiritually the single most important, powerful moment of the Prophet's life, the answer was fairly consistent. It is the Mi'raj, the heavenly ascension of the Prophet, where he's taken by Gabriel, by an angel, from Mecca to Jerusalem, up to God, through the levels of heaven, and he comes to have that which every faithful person of the Abrahamic tradition yearns for, a face-to-face -face encounter with God. At the height of that encounter, which I'll read for you about a little bit in, from this book, God gives the Prophet a choice. O oh, Muhammad, you can either stay in this state of bliss that you are in, or you can choose to return. And what the tradition has recorded the Prophet as saying is the one word answer, Ummati, which is my people. Right? I will, in a matter very much manner, very much like the Buddha, I will forego my own bliss, individual bliss, so that humanity can have the opportunity to have their own illumination, their own salvation their own enlightenment. So he returns to this realm for our sake, so that we too can have a chance to ascend. That narrative for Muslims before 1800, 1850, best encapsulated one of the honorifics that the Prophet has in the Quran. Funny little aside. Up until 1900, Muslims never identified verses by chapter and verse. I have to tell you, it's been hilarious for me, as a Muslim, to walk around these halls the last 24 hours, because I keep hearing all these conversations from people, have you, what do you think about Romans 4.12? What do you think about Ephesians 1.13? And I'm like, man, this chapter and verse citing, this is like serious business here, right? Up until 1900, no Muslim ever referred to verses of the Quran by chapter and verse. They would just give you one or two words in Arabic. And they thought, you know, if you've gone to seminary, you should have memorized the whole thing. Right? The phrase that the Quran identifies the Prophet Muhammad with is Rahmatun lil alameen. A mercy to the cosmoses. A mercy to the universes, in the plural. So Muhammad is a mercy not just to this world, but as many different universes as there are, He's also a mercy to them. And when you read the pre-modern tradition and the medieval tradition, Muhammad's decision to forego his own bliss and come back to earth is the embodiment of him being a channel of mercy for people. 
I'm not a huge fan of making comparisons and analogies across religious traditions because every tradition is different. Let's just say that it's almost as important, maybe as important, as Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection would be to Christianity or the Indian prince Siddhartha Gautama sitting under a Bodhi tree and vowing not to get up until every last blade of grass has achieved enlightenment. It's big. It's what faithful Muslims look to as the paradigmatic spiritual encounter with God. Now if you read a modern biography of the Prophet Muhammad, written by devout Muslims, right? In my opinion, the best biography of the Prophet in the English language is Abu Bakr Sirajuddin, Martin Ling's biography of Muhammad, Muhammad, his life based on the earliest sources. It's even better than mine. That's how good it is. 400 pages, a page and a half on the heavenly ascension. That would be kind of like writing a 400 page book on the life of Jesus, a page and a half on crucifixion and resurrection. Something is off. And why is that? Well, I had to do a little bit of research. And what I found out was, in medieval times, early times, classical times, Muslims look to the Prophet to deliver us. To deliver us from the state that we find ourselves in, the state of wretchedness, the state of sin, the state of being misguided. And we turn to Prophet for intercession, to intercede on our behalf with God, to guide us, to be the one to advocate for us. Nowadays, people look to the Prophet to deliver us, but no longer to deliver us from sin and misguidedness, but to deliver us from the miserable political condition in which we find ourselves, the situation of being colonized, dominated, and politically weak. In the 19th and 20th century, the understandings of the Prophet change from a mercy to the cosmoses to Muhammad the great Arab hero, Muhammad the great nation builder, or to use my favorite 1960s slightly Marxist Egyptian example, Muhammad the socialist imam. We're still looking to him to save us but just to save us from the state of political powerlessness. So Muslims too have forgotten something that I think we are in need of remembrance. But I said that I would also give you something visual. Little footnote, okay? I'm gonna be showing images here. These are images not of the Danish cartoon controversies. I don't do that. I love my prophet. I'm not going to show him with a bomb in his turban. These are images produced by faithful Muslim artists from Turkey, from Iran, from Central Asia, from India. Through centuries, going back a thousand years, many Muslims have produced images like this. Not all Muslims have produced images like this. Some Muslims find some of these images a little problematic. If you happen to be one of them, look down. I can't tell you anything other than that. Let's begin with things like this. So this is a really good example of an Ottoman manuscript. This is a proud Islamic tradition called Qisasul Anbiya, the tales of the prophets, tales of the prophets. These stories take the nuggets of images that you have in the Quran about Adam, David, Solomon, Moses, Jesus, John the Baptist, Mary, and Muhammad, and they flesh them out into full episodes, full narratives. They're organized prophet by prophet by prophet. So this is the first page, the frontal page, of one of these manuscripts. They're lovely, they're beautiful, they're illuminated. Those of you that have worked with illuminated Bibles and illuminated Torahs would immediately recognize the style. And they go through prophet by prophet. 
So here's Adam and Hava, Adam and Eve. A couple of interesting points about this particular painting. They're obviously seated in a celestial setting. Right? They're also wearing Persian clothes. <laughs> you all can put a fig leaf on their private parts if you want. I choose to believe that Adam and Eve in paradise were wearing medieval Persian robes. <laughs> and how are you going to prove to me that they weren't? You also look at their faces. My students say that they look Chinese. It's technically not Chinese, actually, but it's supposed to be Central Asian. Why would Adam and Eve, who are probably African, look Central Asian? Because all the kings are Central Asian. They're all Turkic. The ones who are paying the bill look like this. So you're going to make your great, 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 grandfather and grandmother look like them. Look, you go into most of y'all's churches and some first century Palestinian Jew looks like the dudes from Norway. I don't say anything. If you want to have them have hippie hair, blonde down to here with blue eyes, when you know what first century Palestinian Jews looked like? They looked like me. They were short, they were stocky, they were brown, and they're probably bald. All Middle Eastern men eventually become bald. <laughs> He was short and he was brown. If you want to imagine him six foot five with like flowing limp hair, that's your business to imagine him in your image. So these Muslim artists are imagining Adam and Eve in their image. To use the language of SpongeBob SquarePants, which is about all the high culture references that I have these days because I have kids, they're using their imagination. <laughs> Who is this one? Noah, right? You get the world's most portable zoo with pairs of animals. You get people drowning in the bottom, including Noah's own son, and whales in the background and kind of what have you. The halo that you see, that's a very ancient Near Eastern feature. The flames coming out of people's head. Right? That indicates sanctity and holiness. Now here's one of my favorite images of Abraham sacrificing his son. Mm -hmm. I was politically correct and I just said sacrificing his son. That's all I said. Here's another example of spiritual amnesia. If today I ask Jewish and Christian audiences who the son is, they will tell me Isaac. And if today I ask Muslims who the son is, they would say, if you actually look through classical Islamic tradition, the Muslim answer is not as unanimous as you would think. The majority tradition says Ishmael. Why? Because Abraham has two women who bear him children. There is a time in which Ishmael is his only son. There is no time in which Isaac is his only son. But that was not the unanimous Muslim answer. You had a number, a smaller group of Muslims, mainly converts from Judaism and Christianity into Islam, who bring their tradition and learning and piety with them, who say, nope, it's, it's Isaac, we're pretty sure. We thought it was Isaac when we were Jewish, we're going to think it's Isaac when we're Muslim. I'm not a theologian, so I'm allowed to speculate. I'm also a father. I'm father of four children, including a 17-year-old. My not theological brain, but my father brain, tells me that it had to be Ishmael. And I have convincing proof, so bear with me. When kids are little, they're cute. And God makes you like them. 
you're hopelessly bound to them. They've got round cheeks, big eyes, soft fingers and toes. You don't want to kill your newborns. When they become teenagers, <laughs> once or twice every day, you have thoughts of grabbing the boy by his locks, which have not been washed in three weeks, and sacrificing him to the Lord, because surely this would be pleasing to God. When I look on the face of Abraham, who's got his teenage son by the locks and the knife out, ready to kill the boy. And the angel comes and says, Abraham, I deliver you good news from God, and he has delivered you from this trial, and have brought you a ram. Abraham does not look happy. <laughs> Abraham looks like 30 more seconds, and I would be done with the boy. <laughs> I'm not sure how much theological water this theory holds, but this is my ultimate proof that it had to be Ishmael. It had to. Because if Isaac is like two years old, he's cute, and it goes, pop, 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 and you want to hug him. You don't want to kill him. Anyway. Here you have the same set of manuscripts, Virgin Mary and baby Jesus. The story of Virgin Mary and Christ is linked together, of course, in the Quran. You have much more detail. This is news to some of you. You have much more detail in the Quran about Virgin Mary than you actually do in the New Testament accounts. Right? And the name of Mary is said to have been chosen by God above women of all the worlds. That same phrase that is used to, as, a, as an honorific for Muhammad is used for Mary. Right? Estefa ki for Mary, Mustafa for Muhammad. Hmm? Lots of stories that one could go on to tell here. And then we get to the Prophet Muhammad. Now, if you're a Muslim who's going to be really offended at seeing a historical image of the Prophet Muhammad, this would be the time to close your eyes, think of your grocery list. <laughs> On the left, you have the cover image of one of the best books about the Prophet. It's a book that I had in mind when I was writing my own called, And Muhammad is His Messenger. Where does the phrase come from? From the Shahadatain, from the two-part declaration of faith in Islam. What does it take to be a Muslim? To utter publicly with sincerity a two-part statement. I testify that there is one God. But that doesn't make you a Muslim. That just makes you a monotheist. According to the Bible, even the devil knows that there is just one God. And shudder. And then there's a second part. Wa Muhammadun Rasulullah. And Muhammad is his messenger. Anne-Marie Schimmel, a great German scholar, who spoke 18 languages and had a photographic memory. Yeah. Amazing, amazing teacher at Harvard for many, many decades. She would just lecture by coming to class, putting down her bag, and being like, and today we will look at the image of Muhammad as light. And we will begin in 9th century. Do, 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 do. Oh yes, it's right there. I see it. And from memory, she would say, it's on the lower right-hand side of the page. There it is. She would read it in Arabic and then do an instant translation of it into English. And the same idea is developed in 13th century poetry of Rumi, which is top right side. There it is of the page. She would give you 18 lines of poetry, translate it on the spot. And this goes on to the Turkish interpretations and the Bengali translation. The whole class was like this. And Muhammad is his messenger. What do you have on the right is a 20th century Iranian imagination of the Prophet Muhammad. Okay. Now, this is actually from my house. We left Iran in 1985. 
we were immigrants, refugees. We had to pack what was most precious in the world to us. This icon, this image of the Prophet had been in our home for decades. I couldn't imagine leaving it behind. So I wrapped it up in a towel, put it in a suitcase, came over here. It's in our house, in our living room, right next to beautiful examples of calligraphy and Quranic manuscripts and what have you. In the book I talk about the story of a good friend of mine, a dear person I've known for 20 years, from a very conservative Sunni Pakistani family, came to our home and he loves Islamic art. And he loves the Prophet. And we had a great meal, and he went around our house, as people often do, looking at my books. He was coveting my books. I know he was. <laughs> and he was coveting my art. And he goes, oh, I love that calligraphy. What does it say? And I say, well, that one says, God is the light of the heavens and the earth. It's like, ah, oh, it's so beautiful. MashaAllah. Where is it from? That one is from Cairo. And I love that one. What does it say? That says, in the name of God, the God of mercy, the God of love. It's beautiful. Where is that from? It's from Istanbul. And then he saw this image. And he said, oh, what a distinguished sheikh. What a distinguished spiritual teacher. Who is it? And I was like, dude, of course. I mean, it's, it's, everybody knows. It's the prophet. Bill Cosby has a comedy routine about how his wife had a conniption and her face split and orange lights came beaming out of her eyes and burned him to the pit of his stomach. That's what my friend's face did. And he goes, but Muslims don't depict the prophet. And I was like, but they did. And he's like, but they don't. But they did. But they don't. So we did five minutes of, but they don't, but they did, but they don't, but they do, but they don't, but they don't. And then I was like, you mean they shouldn't? He's like, yes, they shouldn't. Okay, they shouldn't. And I was like, so what do you do about the fact that we have all these miniatures depicting all the prophets, including the prophet Muhammad? And I was like, I've never heard of this. I'm like, what, what do I do about the fact that you haven't heard of something? Do you want me to make it disappear? And he was like, but we love the Prophet so much that if you have images of him, I'm going to start worshipping it. So well, that's your problem. I mean, like, that's not, you know. So then I went to therapy. <laughs> and eventually, after two years of religious therapy, I have been able to come to this very healthy place. Hmm. Ready for it? This cost me 10,000 freaking dollars. <laughs> Some Muslims so love the Prophet that it is helpful for them to have visual representations of the Prophet so that they can ask themselves, if the Prophet is with me, how would I behave? Some Muslims so love the Prophet that out of that same love and devotion for the Prophet, they're afraid of falling into the trap of idolatry. Both groups are, in are inspired by love and devotion to the Prophet, and that love manifests itself slightly differently. I paid $10,000 for that. When we take a look at the images of the Prophet that come, there's a very interesting thing that we learn. How much time do we have? Half? 15 minutes? 15 minutes. Okay. Um, all, right, all right. So, the very first biography of the Prophet Muhammad that was written was actually a two volume work. Right? This is the biography of Ibn Ishaq, which is edited by another scholar, Ibn Hisham. It is the classical biography, to which all the later biographies of the Prophet refer to. This first biography was actually a two-volume work. Volume one was Adam to Jesus. Volume two was Muhammad. Does that sound familiar? Before you get to the story of Muhammad, 
you had to know the prophets that have come before, which from a Quranic perspective, we hold all of them in the same place of honor. We do not distinguish between one and the other. Right? You can't say, I love me some Moses, but that David guy, man, we are not friends. Right? <laughs> and this is one of the Quranic critiques of Christians. I love me some Jesus. It's just all those other ones that don't quite measure up. Right? P.S. and tangent. I love tangents. I'm Muslim. I can't help it. <laughs> Jesus and I have no problem. Jesus and I get along great. But I'm in the South. There's this other character called Jesus. <laughs> Jesus hates me. And Jesus hates Muslims. He hates Jews. He hates gays. Jesus hates a lot of people. I think Jesus needs to go to therapy a little bit. But, but Lord Jesus Christ is lovely. Lord Jesus Christ is great. We have no problems with Lord Jesus Christ. None whatsoever. When you would get to volume two of this book, you would begin to see stories of the life of Muhammad. And when these books became illustrated eventually, they begin with his birth narrative, which interestingly enough, is told from the perspective of who else? Women. So in this book, the Memories of Muhammad book, I've gone through and I've translated a lot of these stories about the birth of Muhammad, which look and read a lot like Christmas narratives, the nativity stories. And they're told from the perspective of the Prophet's mother, who describes that when I became pregnant with Muhammad, rays of light began beaming out of my belly, directed to every direction on the planet. And I felt angels descend down upon me until the point that my entire house became illuminated, and all the great and virtuous women of the past came to be with me. Virgin Mary was with me, and the Pharaoh's wife was with me, and all these angelic beings. In many parts of the Islamic world, for example, the Ottoman Empire, recalling the birth narrative of the Prophet Muhammad became one of the main religious activities of women. Maulid, birthday, Mevlut in Turkish, became a popular ceremony, a family ceremony. But interestingly enough, Christmas doesn't come once a year. The Prophet's birthday could come whenever you're having a gathering. You have a wedding, you celebrate Muhammad's birthday. <laughs> Somebody goes on a great trip and comes back home, you have the Prophet's birthday, right? Because there's a Prophet born in you every minute. <clears throat> Here you have another image of uh, the Maulid, of um, Amina holding the, the Prophet as a baby. And now we get to the part where I'm going to read for you three little short snippets from the book, and then we'll open up for questions and discussions. In I spoke of the three main moments, movements in the Prophet's life. The first one is that he goes up a mountain to meditate, to reflect upon God, and to wonder about the state of his people. It's at one of the points that the angel Gabriel comes to him, and the Prophet, very much like the biblical prophets, right? biblical prophets are sometimes not very happy at having been chosen, because they know how they're going to be received by their people. As I said this morning, no prophet ever comes to his or her people saying, don't change a thing. God loves you. You're doing great, people. Right? They always come, they always say, repent now, for the judgment of the Lord is upon thee. And people stone them. Right? That kind of a prophetic consciousness and the awesome nature of what the prophet had witnessed. He'd seen Gabriel fill the sky from horizon to horizon. He's terrified. He's filled with awe. What in the older usage of English language, we would say he had an awesome experience, even an awful, full of awe experience. So he's going to come back to his closest companion, to his best friend, 
If you're Sunni Muslim, it's not Abu Bakr. And if you're Shi'i Muslim, it's not Ali. It's actually his wife, Khadija. So I'll read one little segment here. If we take seriously the oldest and most reliable biographical account, after his awesome encounter with Angel Gabriel, Muhammad was in need of comfort and reassurance. According to the standard biography of Muhammad from Ibn Ishaq, God provided this comfort through his wife Khadija. She was the first to have faith in God through Muhammad and to believe in the authenticity of Muhammad's experience. She was, to put it more bluntly, the first Muslim of the Muhammadi path. Khadija's support is not left in the abstract. Rather, the biographical accounts of Ibn Ishaq provide two different narratives in which she comforts and shelters Muhammad from his spiritual storm. That's a little plug for you know Bob Dylan, for those of you who are fans out there. <laughs> Continuing his descent from the mountain of light after receiving the awe-inspiring revelation, Muhammad went to his wife. No longer just Muhammad, but now the Prophet. He approached Khadija and sat close to her. The Prophet confided in her that he was concerned that he might become like those poets possessed by the jinn. Khadija responded in compassion, I take refuge in that Abu al-Qasim, father of Qasim. God would not treat you thus, since he knows your truthfulness, your great trustworthiness, your fine character, and your kindness. This cannot be, my dear. And the first time that I read this in the original, what caught my eye was that phrase, my dear. Because right? that's a husband and wife talking. That's two people who are in love talking. It's not Khadija talking with the prophet of God. It's her talking to her husband. The second story is actually even lovelier. And I should say, I heard the second story growing up in Iran. I still hear it in Turkey. I've never heard it in an American Muslim setting. It's not because it's not authentic. It's there in the oldest biography of Muhammad. It's not told in American Muslim settings because we've become prudes. We've become almost puritanical. How does the story go? This narrative is quoted from Khadija herself. She asked Muhammad to inform her when the agent of revelation Gabriel visited him so that she could help him determine if indeed it was the angel or a demon of the type that possessed poets. Muhammad told Khadija the next time Gabriel came to him. She asked him to sit by her left thigh, which Muhammad obliged by doing. She asked Muhammad, do you still see him? Muhammad answered in the affirmative. She then asked Muhammad to sit by her right thigh, and she repeated the same question. And Muhammad again answered in the positive. She then asked him to sit in her lap and asked him if he still saw the angel. Muhammad again, for the third time, said yes. She then loosened the knot on her robe and unveiled her body while Muhammad was still sitting in her lap. At this point, she held the Prophet in the naked embrace of a husband and a wife, which the biography of Ibn Ishaq describes as, and I quote, the Messenger of God, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace and blessing of God be upon him, was between her and her slip dress. She then asked him, do you still see him? Muhammad answered, no. Khadija responded, rejoice and be of good heart. By God, he is an angel and not a demon. Had Gabriel been a demonic being, he would have not fled the scene of a beautiful naked woman. Whereas the angel of revelation, full of modesty, had left the husband and wife alone. 
It's one thing to speak of Muhammad as the prophet, the messenger of God, in terms of his relations to God. Muslims have also imagined Muhammad as the model human being who also illustrates the perfection of every human relation. He's not merely the prophet, he also demonstrates how to be the ideal husband and the ideal father, which is crucial in portraying the life of intimacy and affection. Far from illustrating a model of patriarchy, in which the wife's duty is to provide unquestioned obedience. Here Khadija shelters her husband and comforts him, as he would do for her in other circumstances. We could go on, but I'll stop here. So you get a sense of a very intimate kind of a relationship. And look, every Muslim and their grandmother that I know today is trying to come up with a gender fair model of Islam. And we might have reasonable disagreements about what that should look like, but why would these kinds of stories not be heard in our mosques? Here you have a miniature of Khadija proposing to the Prophet. She proposes to him. And she's 15 years older, something that would still be a little risque in many parts of American society. The next few slides are images of the Mi'raj. I'm just going to show you these images being taken on a journey from Mecca to Jerusalem, the remnants of the Wailing Wall, and from there accompanied up to paradise. Here you see Muhammad being taken in the host of, of angels. Beautiful Muslim miniatures from throughout the centuries. And he's given a tour of heaven and he's given a tour of hell. Those of you who are familiar with medieval Christian imagery would certainly remember things like this. For example, when Jesus goes to hell, you see all the broken keys and locks. Right? You have a very similar kind of imagery going on here as well. Here he has a meeting at every level of heaven with each of the previous prophets. Meets with Adam, meets with Abraham, meets with Christ and with Moses. The story of meeting with Moses is hilarious. Maybe I can tell you that in a, in a meeting, in a question and answer time. And he's given a tour of the garden, which is what paradise is. And he's also given a tour of hell, hellfire. So what's the worst Quranic sin, other than attributing partners to God, the worst thing you could ever do to steal money from orphans? Right? That's the do not stop, go, do not collect 200, just go straight to hell, fast lane answer. And these are people who are in hell, thirsty, and molten lead is poured down their throats, and they're told, devour this for this is what you stole from orphans. Right? This is a very typical part of Islamic teachings where the mystical and the ethical are intertwined. And what I will end my reading with, and we'll open it up for question and answer, is this episode of the Prophet's life, which is the triumphant return to Mecca. Right? Muhammad and his companions are exiled, they too become immigrants, become refugees. They live in the city of Medina, and at the end of his life, they get to return. Medina was and would remain the city of the Prophet, but it was time for Mecca to be returned to the fold of monotheism, as had been intended when Abraham and Ishmael built the Kaaba there. Muhammad assembled an army of 10,000 people and began marching towards Mecca. Less than a generation earlier, all that had stood between him and certain death was a cave hidden by a spider web spun by God's plan. That was part of God's plan, and the return, too, was part of the divine plan. Mecca, where Abraham's temple had been built, was about to be redeemed. This redemption had to be one bathed in mercy. The mercy of the return home would be shown in ways large and small. On the way to Mecca, Muhammad saw a female dog that had given birth to a new litter of puppies. 
Concerned that the commotion of an army of 10,000 might disturb them, Muhammad bid one of his followers to stand guard over them, sheltering them. The mercy that Muhammad showed the dogs of the desert, typically the most despised of all animals in Arabia, he also showed the Meccans who had persecuted him and his followers for a generation. By both Arab and biblical tradition, he had the right to march into Mecca and slaughter all the men and take their women as slaves. Yet Muhammad declared general amnesty for all, establishing a paradigm for forgiveness at the height of his political power. It is one thing to preach nonviolence and forgiveness when one is politically inferior and entirely another to mercifully forgive when one has the power to demolish. On the way to Mecca, one of Muhammad's companions named Saad, who had been chosen as a standard bearer, began rejoicing that this is a day of war and sanctuary no more. Muhammad ordered Ali to take the flag from Saad to make a point about the merciful nature of the day. His old nemesis Abu Sufyan, who had risen up against Muhammad so many times in war, feared for his safety, and yet Muhammad specifically declared Abu Sufyan's house a sanctuary. There's a time to win people over in war, and there's a time to win people over by the charm of one's personality. This was a time for mercy. I'll skip to the last sentences. It is one thing to forgive a faceless enemy, but quite another to reconcile with those who have persecuted us and our loved ones. Muhammad came face to face with Hind, who had devoured the liver of Muhammad's uncle Hamza. She was a cannibal um, who had demonstrated her strong dislike for Muhammad's uncle. When she declared her intention to embrace Islam, Muhammad simply said to her, Welcome. When the son of his former nemesis, Abu Jahl, entered the area, Muhammad bid his companions not to speak ill of Abu Jahl for, and I quote, Reviling of the dead gives offense to the living and reaches not the dead. Here's, I guess, what I would love to close with and open things up for, for discussion. If the term Muslim is to have a genuine meaning today, it has to stand for more than simply being a monotheist. If the term Muslim is to be worthy of the name, it has to mean that there is a community of people whose ethics, whose morals, whose behavior, whose actions in this world, in this very difficult, turbulent world that we live in, aspires to the example of Muhammad. They are people who would aspire to be what I've called in this book Muhammadi, Muhammad like, the people of the Prophet. We have spent in this country 10 years now, 10 years, explaining at every turn and in every opportunity what Islam is not. Time and yet again, we have been asked to proclaim from every mountaintop and every valley, every church and synagogue and mosque and college campus, that Islam is not about terrorism, not about fanaticism, not about extremism, not about patriarchy and misogyny, not about terrorism and anti-Semitism. My sense of having studied the religious history of humanity is that no human being wakes up in the morning and says, today I choose to be Christian because of what Christianity is not. 
Today, I aspire to be a Jew because of what Judaism is not. At some point, we have to create spaces and opportunities so that people of faith, of all faith, Muslim, Jewish, Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, can speak for themselves and can decide what their faith should stand for, what spiritually and morally and religiously they aspire to, and how through that they hope to have that face-to-face -face encounter with God. Let me stop here and open it up for your questions. Are you leaving or what are you getting up? You know, just. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the, the floor is yours and it's open. And uh, Franz is usually very good about uh, saying things like, you know, keep your questions, comments, sermons um, to. Well, just to a, a, a good cop, bad cop routine, right? Uh, but I, I do ask here's the microphone. I ask you to, uh, to use the microphone for your questions. I have only the request that the questions be short, relevant, and above all, that they be questions. <laughs> Can you come forward to the, to the microphone? Or I think... Uh, if you have difficulty getting to the microphone, I can get the microphone to you. Um. The um, variations in spelling of Muhammad's name, hmm. um, is that largely geographical, cultural? Okay. Yeah, um, it, it comes down to from what language did the name Muhammad enter into English? So at times in South Asia and Turkish-speaking regions, the last vowel of Muhammad's name, Muhammad, becomes Muhammad. And in Turkey, actually, there's a lovely custom of um, you would never want to take the Lord's name in vain, and you would never want to insult one of the Prophet's names. And since Muhammad is the most popular name in the world, and there's lots and lots of kids named Muhammad, you would never want to be like, Muhammad, come here and clean your room, right? So there's actually a Turkish version of Muhammad, Mehmet that is used so that you never use the prophet name by sort of that's the that's the vernacular turkish justification for that name that's thank you the other thing i'd like to ask you to make some comment about the nation of islam and the re the relationship between that oh, group goodness. and okay yes and whatever um, you want to say about that is okay with me um i have i'll i'll make it short and sweet just like me um <laughs> and um and furry, and, and say the following. The Nation of Islam is a black empowerment movement that began in Detroit in the 1920s. Uh, it is a flipping of early 20th century racial, if not racist, Christian worldviews, which would have put the white man as God and the black man as subhuman and virtually animal. All they did was to flip it and to say the white man is the devil, the black man is God. Um, there was a teacher who appeared in Detroit named W.D. Fard, F-A-R-D. Um, W.D. Fard claimed to be Allah, God incarnate, which if you know something about the Islamic tradition, is ever so slightly problematic. Because look, if we can't have Jesus be God, we're not going to have W.D. Ford be God, okay? Um, and W.D. Ford chose a prophet named Elijah Poole, who changed his name to Elijah Muhammad. And so they ended up with this maxim, where you might have heard of, I testify that there is but one Allah, and that Muhammad is the apostle of God. Except that the Allah that they're talking about is W.D. Ford, and the Apostle Muhammad is Elijah Paul Muhammad. Um, what's fascinating about the nation of Islam, 
And I will go on record as saying that I tend to have a lot of sympathy for black empowerment movements of theological resistance varieties is the fact that they become the channel whereby people like Malcolm X and Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, joined the fold of Islam and over a period of 30 years they move from the nation of Islam to the classical Islamic tradition that we've been talking about here. Today, 98% of all African American Muslims in this country are part of the classical Islamic tradition. And yet, we don't hear a lot about them. Why? Because they're just peaceful, normal American citizens. There's still Louis Farrakhan, who contributes much to the older understanding of the nation of Islam, even though he too has come a long ways. And he, every few years or so, ends up in the news because he says something about Jews are sucking the blood out of the black community and everybody loses their freaking mind and he ends up on the front page of the New York Times. <laughs> so, yes. I was um, just wondering in this book that you wrote, um, is there a specific time in the prophet's life that gets more focused than the rest, or is it pretty much evened out? Um, and also, what kind of uh, sources did you use? Did you use the Hadith a lot, or um, were there other um, previously written books? I mean, you already mentioned a few. Yeah. And then what? also, what sources did you find for the early life, like his, his birth, his childhood before the revelations? Thank you for that question. I appreciate it. So, um, I tried to space out the coverage of the Prophet's life, but there are certain moments that I paid more attention to. So I paid a lot of attention to the birth of the prophet, the life of the prophet as a young man when he would go and meditate on mountaintops, reflecting on the state of the world, and um, as, as, a, as a mystic would oftentimes. I looked at the example of him receiving the revelation from Gabriel, how he delivered the message to his people. We looked at the issue of the Hijra, the migration from Mecca to Medina, the Mi'raj, which I think has been a forgotten or marginalized aspect of the Prophet's life, and I, I give that a whole chapter in this book. And then the triumphant return to Mecca. In terms of sources, I try to start with the Quran to look at the Sira narratives, the biographical accounts of the Prophet Muhammad, take account of Hadith literature, the sayings and utterances of the Prophet, and also pay close attention to how Muslims have remembered these episodes. So the meaning given to these various episodes by Muslims through the last 1400 years. And I try to make sure that one takes a look not only at the early Arabic sources, which are indispensable, but that you also look at the broad range of Muslims. So if you read the whole thing, there's material there obviously from the early Arabic tradition, but also from Persian Muslims, Turkish Muslims, Pakistani Muslims, Indian Muslims, Central Asian Muslims, European and American Muslims. Try to be as inclusive in that sense as, as possible. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your question. It was, it was a good question. Good evening. Good evening. What do you think is the, uh, what do you hypothesize as the main driving force of the chasm that has developed between Islam and Judaism and Christianity, understanding that these religions are all interconnected, building upon each other? I mean, how has it gotten to this point, basically? Well, the introduction to the volume addresses that question. Um, and what I've tried to talk about there is on one hand acknowledging that many of the polemics that particularly develop between Christians and Muslims, Muslims and Jews have actually been much nicer to each other theologically than Muslims and Christians have had because Jews didn't have an empire by this time. Muslims and Christians are competing, not just theologically, but civilizationally. And look, if you put yourself in 7th century Christian shoes, right, Grand Rapids is what, 350,000? What's a small suburb of this town? How, what's the population? 
Help me out, somebody. I just named it. I don't know. 70,000. Go smaller. Give me a smaller suburb. What's the population of Grand Valley State? Go smaller. Give me a town that's like 10,000 people. Howard City. Howard City, great. Imagine Howard City having a profit, and in a hundred years, Howard City taking over an area from India to Spain greater than Rome at its zenith. That's the story of Islam. And much of the areas that Muslims conquer were formerly Christian. So there is not just a theological competition, but also a civilizational one. And for a lot of Christians, they're like, wait, well, I thought we were God's favorite people. What's this new thing? It must be a heresy. Many of the polemics that we continue to hear that Muslims don't worship the true God, that Muhammad is a charlatan, that he's a plagiarizer, that Muslims have an issue with sex, and that Muslims are inherently violent. That a lot of these tropes and stereotypes and cliches go back to medieval times. Some of it very vile, some of it from beautiful high classic art like Dante. Right? The question for us today is why do these continue to be recycled? And I think a lot of it has to do with the Cold War era mentality. Many people in this country got used to thinking of the world in a bifurcated way. Us against them, capitalism and communism, US and Soviet Union. Soviet Union fell, communism, at least as a political philosophy, was discredited. But people didn't change their thinking. They wanted to find a new enemy. And many of the same people who were Cold War era warriors simply substituted Islam for communism. The green menace of Islam took the place of the red menace of communism. Virtually all of the neoconservatives started out as being anti-Soviet thinkers. And they just haven't adjusted. Islam is not a nation state. So I mean, I think some of those factors are partially to explain. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. I'm Imam Morsi Salim. I'm from Egypt and I'm a religious leader for Islamic Mosque and Religious Institute in East Paris. And I spent uh, almost 25 years in the migration from Al Azhar uh, University. And uh, uh, your your uh, your uh, speech is very very uh, good. Jazakumullah khair. May may Allah reward you. Amen. But I have two small concerns. The images it's, of the Prophet and it's it's not exactly. But to to let to make myself free uh, before Allah in the day of judgment when I see some something, I, I have to say. Uh, according to my knowledge, or according to uh, uh, the reality knowledge uh, in the Quran and the Sunnah of uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the first the small concern uh, when you were talking about Prophet Ibrahim and his son Ismail, it looked like uh, he he wa he he was hating his son and he tried to to kill him, and but this is what. What our belief told uh, our book told us in the Quran, فلما أسلم وتله للجبين when they both of them submit themselves to God into to God the Son and the, and, the, and the Father both of them they were loving this this uh, action to slaughter his son and his son he loved to to obey his father. In, the, in that in that time, and the, the important uh, uh, for human beings to show their God, they are uh, 
they are uh, obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is important Allah does not have any benefit when you slaughter the, the sacrifice during the Hajj or blemish, blemish or the, 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 the time of, of uh, Eid Adha I, I, I'm sorry, this is just, uh, and now, uh, when, when you were talking about this kind, all the, the people was loving for this, this issue, but this is, it's not, uh, it's not the correct way what the Quran taught us about Prophet Ibrahim and Prophet Ishmael. They were very excited to love God, to obey God, to listen what God told them, and this is the, the how to teach our children to respect God, to respect the, the, the parents, to respect, this is the first concern, uh, just to concern, it's not a question. And the second one, very, very quickly, uh, uh, you mentioned about two books in the in the in the in the uh, legal ways of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, Sirat ibn Ishaq and Sirat ibn Hisham, I memorized those two those books. What they said, they they mentioned about the description of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He he uh, has tall or uh, he was white or it, something like this. And the very important for for us to know, there is no one from the specific area for Prophet Muhammad وسلم, mentioned once about, about the picture of Prophet Muhammad or the picture of angels or the picture of prophets. There is no one. And those people, even in the, for Prophet Moses or Prophet Jesus or, or, Prophet, or Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon all of them, all of them, in what they were in this area, in the Middle East, in the uh, in the Palestine or Egypt or uh, Saudi Arabia, there is no one from the scholars of Islam mentioned about there is picture for some some prophets or angel. How to imagine about angel? He has two wings and uh, he flies. Or yeah, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he described angels. He has six hundred wings but how to imagine this this is only my concern to make myself free uh, when i met god in the day of judgment thank you so much for your patience with me and may god forgive all of us and this is only and also i can read the the, the written it's not arabic written this is some some maybe the other 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 written this is the idea it's, it's the ottoman language sir it's not arabic just, just no. my concern thank yeah. you so much for your listening thank you uh, thank you good um, well, let me just answer, uh, or at least add a couple of things to what you have said, and let me let me just begin by saying that one of the things that that ten thousand dollars of therapy, which I didn't really pay for, but you know, it makes a good funny story, um, is I have come to appreciate the fact that people and Muslims express their piety in very different ways, um, and I I appreciate and I receive with an open heart your concerns about being in front of God in the Day of Judgment. And I'm honored by that. Um, let me also add a couple of other things. So you mentioned the way that the Quranic narrative uh, talks about the story of Abraham and the sacrifice of Ishmael. Of course, the Akedah is one of the key moments of, of, of Jewish life and central to understandings of Christianity as well. One of the things that's lovely, and I think you and I would be in agreement here, about the way that the Quranic narrative works, perhaps in distinction to the biblical narrative, is if you read the biblical account at the moment in which Abraham is speaking to his son, and I'm fond of the Quran in the same way that you are, he begins by saying, Ya Bunaya, right? Oh, my little boy, sunny boy, right? I've had a dream, a ro'ya, <laughs> in which God has commanded me to kill you. What do you think about that? And Ishmael says, if this is what God has commanded you to, then you will find both of us submitting. I love that verse so much, I name my daughter after it. So my daughter's name is Roya, Roya, because of that. 
Yes, you're exactly right. In the Quranic context, the sacrifice is an action in which Abraham and Ishmael both participate in. And in the Quranic commentary accounts, as well as in some parts of the Jewish tradition, there are many extra points that come up in the tafsir tradition where Ishmael says to him, and daddy, when you're going to slaughter me, do it in one quick motion because your love for me is so great that your hand may tremble at some point. And when you go back, don't give all the details to mommy because it's going to break her heart, right? So yes, there is that very humane tradition there. As to my jokes and humor, honestly what I can tell you is that this is a cultural difference between you and me. Um, I look like an Iranian, but culturally I'm an American. And we make jokes like this. This is what we do. We have teenagers, they're smelly, they don't shower, they don't bathe. We say that they live in a pigsty. Not because I think my son is a pig, but because their rooms are messy. And it's said out of love, not out of a disrespect for my son or for Ishmael or for Abraham. And my hope would be that, inshallah, in a few years of after you have been here, you would see that that same humor is not a lack of respect for the Quranic verse. It's part of the American tradition of, of things. When, when you give talks to groups like this, you have to be up here for an hour and a half or two hours. And humor is a wonderful way of grabbing and holding people's attention. Um, there's also, and we're just having chat, they're not listening. You and I can sit here and have a conversation and say, you need to see Muslims as human. Right? We can say that until we're blue in the face. Right? One of the ways that you actually show people that you're human is they let you see your humor, that you love your children and you get frustrated. Because you know what they're thinking? I am frustrated too because I have a teenage son and at some point I wanted to kill him too. Right? And so it's not about actually humanizing Muslims. You can only humanize something that's not already human. One of my main points is that we, as God's children, are already in possession, in full possession of humanity. But there are obstacles, barriers, veils in front of us that prevent us from seeing each other's humanity. I found over the years that humor is a great way of shattering those blockages so that people come to see you as a full human being that has a lot of the same concerns. It is not a disrespect for the Islamic tradition or the Quran. If it were, I wouldn't have devoted the same amount of time that you have in learning and studying and teaching about this particular tradition. And as far as the issue of the images, I, I said in the beginning, I know this is difficult for a lot of people. And here's the interesting part, and I have no explanation for this. These kinds of images were and are, it's not a Sunni thing, it's not a Shi'i thing, in fact the majority of them are produced by Sunni artists. They were done from a thousand years ago till today in India, in Pakistan, in Central Asia, in Iran, in the Ottoman Empire. The one part of the world that didn't produce them was the Arab area. I don't know why, I can't explain it. I know that there is emphasis on language. I know that there's the Shama'il tradition where the description of the Prophet is done and there's a poetic tradition. I love the Qasida Burda as much as the next person and I have translations of it in the book as well. The miniature tradition flourishes everywhere but the Arab context. But as a historian of Islam, I can't say that Muslims never did this art because we did. It's a part of our broad tradition, even though not every Muslim today is familiar with that. So I don't show these images to say that everyone should like them or everyone should have them, but simply to make the point that some Muslims did. And they did it as faithful Muslims, paid for by the Muslim caliphs. It's the Ottoman Khalifa and the court of the Ottomans that is paying for the patronage of this art form. So, thank you so much for your question. Yes, sir. Two more questions? Or are there more questions? Two more questions. 
Uh, this morning on the breakout session with uh, Professor Fitzpatrick, you uh, translated uh, one uh, verse from the Koran, and then you did an interpretation of what it was. Right. And I was curious if uh, other uh, Muslim traditions would have different interpretations or if that's kind of an example of a generalized thing that most traditions would agree with. Okay, so for the benefit of those who are not in the room with us, here's what we were talking about in the breakout session that... Um, Dr. Chaley Fitzpatrick was leading. Um, there was a question asked about literalism and the Quran. If Muslims believe that the Quran is literally the word of God, doesn't that close certain possibilities? And I was simply making the case that up until 1900, Muslims were never, and listen to this word carefully, exclusively literalistic. Muslims have always believed that the Quran is the word of God revealed in the Arabic language and the Quran is literally true. And Muslims would always go on and say that the Quran is also true at many interior levels. Quick little theological explanation. The Quran is the word of God. God in the Islamic tradition is described as al-zahir wal batin the manifest and the hidden, the external and the inward. Therefore, the word of God would also have a manifest level of meaning and hidden inward level of meaning. So the argument that Muslims had historically was not, is the Quran literally true? They would all agree on that. The question was, at how many inward levels is it also true? What are the inner meanings, the mystical meanings, the philosophical meanings, the hidden meanings? And who is authorized to access them? Is it the mystics? Is it the philosophers? Is it the family of the prophets? Is it the religious scholars? Kind of who is it? And so you've had a rich Islamic tradition of accessing grammatical readings of the Quran, philosophical readings of the Quran, mystical readings of the Quran, theological readings of the Quran, um, Shi'i readings of the Quran. And these account for many different genres of Quranic commentary. The verse that we talked about this morning is a famous verse of the Quran. When kings enter a village, they decimate it. When kings enter a village, they decimate it, which I said this morning is a very biblical sounding verse. And in the tradition that is very popular in this part of the world, there's a very famous Muslim poet and sage, Maulana Jalal ad-Din Rumi. Rumi is now the best-selling poet in America. When Rumi gets to that verse, the interpretation that he gives to it is as follows. When kings enter a village, they decimate it. King, God. Village, heart. When God enters your heart, God decimates anything in your heart that is other than God. Anything that is blocking your way to God, God decimates it so that there remains nothing in your heart other than Allah. Right? That's very typical of the kind of poetic and mystical interpretation that was actually quite commonplace in an Islamic tradition. So then, most different traditions, uh, all the different uh, Shiites or Sunnis or whatever, would have the same interpretation? No, they would not have the same interpretation. I mean, they, you have 1.6 billion Muslims, 1,400 years of tradition. Um, but each person, each school of thought would bring their own interpretive move to the scripture. One more question. My name is Lorenzo Miguel. I heard in the morning, like you presented beautifully, how is um, Islam, how is the, like you presented, very humble. And this evening, again, it's like presented, uh, Islam is like a, a beautiful uh, religion. I agree. And the question is, why... Uh, we hear uh, through the news when some Muslims became Christian, accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior, as their personal Savior, they are being killed, they are being persecuted, not here, 
but in many, many Muslim countries. And they don't allow to build a church. What is the difference uh, between this beautiful Islam presented here beautifully in peaceful way, but in those countries, when somebody becomes a Christian, is being persecuted and being killed. Because the countries that you're referring to, Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, do not have freedom of religion. Not only do they not have freedom of religion, they don't have freedom of press, they don't have freedom of assembly, they simply lack in the entire corpus of religious and political rights that we take to be the cornerstone of what makes America great. But they believe in Muhammad. They read the Quran, they worship the same, uh, I mean, Muhammad. Martin Luther King read the Bible and the KKK reads the Bible, but they do radically different things to it, mm -hmm. and Muslims are no exception. Okay. Um, the challenge in those countries is that they not only prosecute and persecute religious minorities, they also prosecute and persecute Muslims, who are oftentimes reformists and journalists and human rights workers, because their interpretations of Islam or their embrace of other religious traditions poses a challenge to the autocratic methods and despotic methods mm -hmm. of the state. And one of the things, some years ago, during the time of the Bush administration, they approached me to serve on that commission for preservation of religious rights around the world. Um, I turned it down. The reason that I turned it down is that pretty much the exclusive concern of the commission at that time was to protect Christian minorities around the world. I'm all for protection of Christian minorities, but the framework under which I will sign up for something is one that guarantees equal rights for all, rather than seeking to protect one specific community from persecution. And they wouldn't be willing to go that far. Their concern was sort of different than... Muslims in America or North America will be different. It will be not persecuting Muslims who's becoming Christian. I would hope not. Our, again, our country is founded upon a certain set of ideals that last time I checked <laughs> is still valid. And my hope is that those of us in this country continue to bring out not only the best of our religious traditions, but the best of our civic and political institutions, rather than looking over our shoulder and saying, you know, let's see how bad Pakistan is acting, and can we act just as bad as them to teach them a lesson?